help us to get our government back in a sense, Lord. We, we originally had a government by the people, for the people, and other people. We need to reestablish that. We ask for it. Okay, so for a little turn, and I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Go ahead and be seated. Um, my name is Ann Degrees. This is my husband, Noel. Um, we're sort of the host instigators, or whatever you want to call us. Um, in, I want to call just a couple of ten, uh, your attention to a couple of things, and then we'll get right into it with Senator Schauer. Um, all of you should have gotten a packet tonight. If you didn't, there's plenty there. I think we made 50, so I don't think we're running out yet. Um, the first night we had class, we had a survey, and so the classes we're having now are pretty much the result of that survey. And so I thought maybe it was time that we redid another survey. So if you will take and complete this survey and just leave it on the back table. Then the next uh, pages are yours to take. And we have a petition in the back after you read the next few pages if you're interested. Uh, for my senator, Senator Shelley sponsoring Senate Joint Resolution Number 4, which deals with the privacy portion of the state of Alaska's Constitution. And that's the one red flag that people are putting up saying um, that we can deal with abortion in the state of Alaska. So um, there's an email there on the front. Um, there's public testimony going to be taken tomorrow afternoon at 1.30 on the back. On the back of that page is a page of phone numbers. Oops, sorry. They sort of look like that if you can and want to call in. And um, then also here is a, a sponsor statement. When someone sponsors a bill in the legislature, this is one of the things they do, and it's called a sponsor statement. It tells about what the piece of legislation is that they are introducing. Uh, it explains, like, if it does pass, what does it mean? And um, just some encouragement for other people, other legislators to sign on as co sponsors. So that's from Shelly. And then the very back of that page is the Senate Joint Resolution. Now for those of you that don't know, a Senate Joint Resolution is, is not a bill. Lots of the things you're probably following or we've encouraged you to follow will be like Senate Bill 39, which is the election integrity. This is Senate Joint Resolution. That's the SJR. And so what that means is this, the Senate, it's been introduced in the Senate. If it passes the Senate, it will go over to the House. Now, it is not um, restricted regarding whether the governor vetoes or approves this because it's not a bill and does not come become law. What Shelley is asking that it be put on the ballot for people to vote on, and you'll see that as you read through it. And if you are in support of this, and you know, and even if you are going to be able to call in tomorrow afternoon, we do have some petitions back there, and um, you can sign your name, and then you can, if you want Shelley to get back to you, put your email or your phone number there. Um, and if you don't, just sign your name, and then I will take and email those into the committee uh, for, uh, for in support. And all it says is on the petition is, um, thank you, Senator Hughes, for introducing this. Uh, we are in support. And so uh, that's back there also. So um, we're meeting the first and third um, Mondays. Um, the next time we're going to meet is April 5th 
And for those of you that have uh, caught him before, we're going to have the second session on the U.S. Constitution with Nikki Shibaka. And if you weren't here for that one or you haven't watched it on the Facebook, um, be sure and come. Um, it's powerful. I think everybody really enjoyed it. And I don't know if it will lead into a third one or not, but um, it was uh, it was uh, well worth your time. Friend of mine on Facebook, and you have not received an invitation to the School of Government. We have kept the School of Government on Facebook as a private group. Uh, I think probably for obvious reasons, and so I think you probably no one understand that. But just uh, go ahead and on Facebook, my uh, account on Facebook is Edna Bell Armstrong Degrees. Be um, a member, and I'll put you on. And that's where we keep track of, you know, all the live Facebooks go on there, all the videos go on there. We talk about upcoming classes, things like that. Other people post things um, on there, and uh, so uh, just so you can keep track of it. And for the new people that came tonight, we did ask um, for your phone number or your email address. Um, because we're only meeting the first and third Monday, sometimes it gets a little bit long in between. Like this month in March, there's five Mondays. So uh, we just, you know, want to keep you. We know you all have busy lives, and so we just want to remind you again and let you know who is coming. Anyway, the plan is for tonight, as you all know, Senator Shower is in Juno, so we got him zoomed in there. That's not him there, because nobody was wondering. <laughs> and so uh, the two, ah, there he is. Hello! And um, two bills, I don't know for sure. We're not going to hold him to just those two bills, but they were the, they were the two bills I thought was the most interesting that he has. Um, and I didn't make copies of Senate Bill 39, which is the election integrity. And I think Mike will tell you that that's being completely redone. Correct? Senator Sharp, can he hear me? So I'm going to turn it over to you, sir. You go ahead and go for it. We'll probably have um, probably like about 45 minutes of, or however long, but no more than 45 minutes for you to talk. And then we'll go into a question and answer period. We try to wrap up by 8.30, so, okay? Thanks. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah. Hard to tell off the screen there. The guy that's sitting up front in the front row, can you wave if you hear me all right? Because I'm not getting any feedback. There you go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Worked, you didn't get it. Will Rogers, uh, yeah, anyways, danger Will Rogers, and that's what I was thinking. I don't think it'd take that long yet. I'll, I'll go relatively quickly. I, you guys, at least those that listen to me now, then you know I talk fast. I'll try not to do that. I will address SB 39. We can certainly talk about SJR 4, SB 14, other ones, and I'll say what those mean in a minute. Uh, I would like to direct this as much as I can to questions as opposed to me just up here yapping at you so that I can answer questions people may have. So we'll start first with, uh, well, just so you know, anyway, if I haven't met some of you, Mike Schauer, Senator from the Valley, uh, State Senator, District E, represent kind of the north half of the Matsu, goes up all the way uh, through Willow, Talkeet, now almost to Cantwell, on the back the other side, Glen Allen, uh, Delta Junction, Valdez, Whittier, et cetera, et cetera. So there you go. Stuck in Juneau right now in a snowstorm, but that's the way it goes because our capital is still way down here, hard to get to, but I won't go there. As you voted three times to move it, we haven't done that yet. So let's get on to the issues of SB 39. That is a bill, and I want to spell a couple of rumors here for folks because there's a lot of them that have been floating around on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and the Anchors Democrat, I mean the Anchors Daily News, I'm sorry, almost said it, um, and a few other news sources that are not accurate as far as what we did. First of all, we started working on this bill about three years ago, and we first filed a version of the bill over two years ago. 
And the irony is, is that uh, we've been called a lot of really bad names for doing this, um, and we started the effort when it was what I would describe as the left half of the political spectrum of the country was upset about the election results, not by president, fraud, stolen election, etc. And here we are four years later, and a couple of years after the first version of the bill we filed, now it's the other kind of half of the country that is upset about the same election results. So a lot of people seem to have had their faith shaken. So this is not a new bill. It's not something that we just did over the last election results. We have been working on this for years. I would say that we added a few things after this last election cycle, but we've also been digging pretty hard, and we learn about different things that may be loose as one term uh, in the sense of there are areas for improvement in our election system. And I'll clear up another misconception that this was all about fraud. We have never contended there was great fraud or thousands of cases. There's fraud, and a lot of them are one-off cases. There's some here, some there. There's a, a former representative in Anchorage that may find herself in trouble for having fraud, or alleged fraud, I should say, um, that's happening. So we know that there's fraud out there, but honestly, uh, and frankly, what we started the effort with was looking at what we call chain of custody and also looking at our voter registration rules and a few other topics, realizing that we don't have much in the way of securing our election system. It's, it's pretty open, and I'll explain that as we go. And a few other just of the misconceptions real briefly that have popped out. You know, we're not um, trying to take away local municipalities' ability to control their elections, and that's been thrown out there as we're trying to do that. That's not true. We're not taking away or stopping mail-in voting or absentee voting. That's not true. Um, and there's a few other things we can talk about if you have questions specifically. I would also say we're adding a few things on both sides of the spectrum politically, both right and left, of things people want to see. If you've never heard of ballot curing, we have that. It's something that a lot of folks have wanted to see where instead of operating on the principle of what we call ballot rejection, which is what we do now, we essentially look at your ballot and it's got a tear mark on it, it's missing a piece of information, we basically reject it. And that's the end of it. And you may never know that you didn't vote unless you follow up that your vote wasn't counted, your ballot wasn't counted. We want to give people the opportunity to vote absentee or mail in if they decide to for whatever reason, but the ability to fix it. So working on a system of ballot qualification, if you will, as opposed to rejection. So I'm gonna that's just some of the highlights I'm gonna talk about the Senate bill here. I'm gonna read off my screen now with the PowerPoint presentation. So what is it essentially about? It's improving election integrity in Alaska through data security, voter validation, and ballot authentication. So we have a couple things as we go through it. And I'm not going to get into detail and read every one of these. I don't want to bore you to tears. I'll let you ask questions. But there's a couple legs of this stool, if you will, that we're looking at. First of all, we call it multi-factor authentication. So let's say, for example, I want to get into the other job I have where I work, and I want to get into the system to do things, work on my schedule, whatever it is. To do that, I have to have my username. I have to have a password that I make up. And I put those in, and then I get requested to have a token. There's another application that provides a token that every 30 seconds or so is uh, reset. And if I don't have that token within 30 seconds entered into the system, I don't get in because they assume it's a hacker or something else. We don't have that in our voting system. And yet, as somebody was telling us just the other day, it's like Domino's can track your pizza to the, <laughs> to the foot on where it is on any time and deliver it to you, know right where it's at, FedEx, UPS, Amazon, track packages all over the world, and know right where they are, who they're going to, when they sign for them. And yet we send out ballots to people, and once we send them out, folks, we don't know who gets them on the other side. We have no idea. And then when those ballots get accepted somewhere, somebody writes some stuff on them, sends them back in, we essentially, without some very gross thing that happens, because I say thing because there's so many parts it could be, that we accepted what's called prima facie. We just accept that it's good and nothing could possibly be wrong unless we see a torn envelope or something on the outside. So we have an entire system where we mail out tens of thousands and tens of thousands of ballots with no real way to cross-check them. We do have the witness signature, which a judge by herself decided this last election cycle she was going to invalidate, and it says quite clearly the Constitution only the only the uh, legislature makes laws regarding elections, and yet a judge decided that she was going to override that all by herself, and she did. The one cross-check that we really have to have somebody as a witness signature to you signing a ballot that's an absentee or mail-in ballot was stripped away. 
So there was nothing. You can have an X and O, a squiggly line, counts as a signature. I would also add that in that multi-factor authentication, some of you sitting in the room may have had your data breached. We found out, State did, the Lieutenant Governor's Office specifically, a week before the general election in November, that there was a data breach. 113,000 Alaskans' data was breached. They let the election go, did not say anything. We certified the election, and then a month after the election, when it was certified, decided to send a letter out to tell people we had a problem. Well, I don't know if you were aware of this, but we actually can online request a ballot. You can go online, send an email to the Division of Elections, say, I'd like to get my ballot online. They will send you a link. You open up, you print your own ballot. Then you can fill it out and send it in. Interestingly enough, as we went through the ballot itself, you could find that all of the information that was stolen in the data breach is enough to fill out one of those online ballots, or other ballots, in fact, and send them back in. But we are told, don't worry, there's nothing to see here. So I say all these things, folks, because we're not, we never have contended that fraud is rampant and it's all over. What we have seen is a massive introduction of the possibility of error in our system because we are mailing out so many ballots. And when you look at the other part of it, when we get next to accurate, secure data, is that we have upwards of 100, 120,000 people that are registered to vote that probably shouldn't be aren't any more eligible to vote, whatever it happens to be. They had about 730,000 Alaskans in the state, probably a little less than that now. And if you take out just under 18 alone that are not eligible to vote for kids, for children, that takes you down to about 600,000. Well, on the books, according to Division of Election testimony on the record a few weeks ago in the state affairs, they told us there's 600,000 Alaskans basically registered to vote. So what about the 14 and a half thousand felons that aren't supposed to vote? What about all the transients that come up here and the other people included that? We saw numbers of probably about 478,000 is all we should have, and yet we're showing 600,000 people. So we contend that there is so much error introduced to the system. We are mailing out ballots ad nauseum and just sending them out. We're not checking for anything. We have no method of chain of custody of the ballots. We're not checking witness signatures. The state doesn't even check signatures, period, coming back. We had data stolen, so anybody could request ballots to send them in. We had ballot harvesters being paid, who is right now is illegal in many states, but not here, who were paid for by Democrat campaigns, for we know for sure, who went through neighborhoods canvassing and asking people, I'll take your ballot, I'll take your ballot, don't worry, I'll help you out. It happened all over the state. So our point to this, folks, is we have seen a lot of information that shows that um, we can do better. And that's the point of this. So this multi-factor authentication is one of these three legs of a stool. And like I said, that's the kind of thing where we go, there are ways for us to send a ballot, for example, to somebody, track it, know like you would get your credit card, and then say a week later you would get a pen in the mail to be able to validate that. It's called multi-factor authentication. It's one thing we think we can do to tighten it up. And if we were to do something like this and make it tight, well, guess what, folks? Mail-in balloting, absentee ballots shouldn't, shouldn't bother anybody anymore because we know for a fact we can track those ballots and we know who's getting them. That would uh, alleviate a lot of concerns on, on a lot of sides. Second thing, accurate and secure data. Uh, at the core of any system um, that we have at all is data, right? If the data is corrupt, the entire system is corrupt. Accurate voter rolls are paramount. I just alluded before about how inaccurate our voter rolls seem to be. There's probably 14, 15 systems that we could use to cross-check data, uh, and we don't do that. But when we had public testimony, there was a few, only a few, that were actually uh, cross-checked against. And I'll give you another example. A lot of people are upset about PFD automatic registration. So if you want your PFD, you have to, to get your PFD, you are automatically registered. You don't have a choice. You registered to vote. That's led to a lot of problems. This came from the Lieutenant Governor's Office. They're the ones that asked for this change, so we put it into the bill at the request. And essentially what it is, is you say that uh, you get your PFD, right? You sign your application for it, you're automatically registered to vote, like it or not. We've had some issues with felons being registered, with non-citizens being registered, as we're told from the, the Lieutenant Governor's Office at DOE. Uh, we've had cases of people where they register and their address is different from that versus work and what else they do, so they're not getting it. So it's caused a lot of issues for us, um, and we don't really clean those rolls up. The other thing we found that was fairly disturbing was that, remember, in that 113,000 da uh, persons data breach that were Alaskans, we looked at that, we had 600 people that were from other countries that are no, nothing to do with Alaska. They're from China, Uzbekistan, Venezuela, Costa Rica. <laughs> they're all over the planet. We're like, wow, okay, where'd that come from? But when the PFT division 
gets this automatic registration, all they do is take that person's data and they just send it with no cross check to Division of Elections, Division of Elections told us they don't do any data, they basically accept it. Folks, that could be thousands, that could be tens of thousands of people that are never cross checked to see if they're appropriate or should be on the voter rolls. And then we have these other lack of cross checks when we don't use other databases to see whether or not these, those people still live here anymore, felons, whatever it happens to be, military that are gone, you name it, that should no longer be in Alaska's voter rolls. So they just accept that data. Now the PFD division might go and deny that because they do their own security checks, right? They go and see, does the person live here? Are they, are they qualified? Well, that's not what happens with the data at the DOE. All of these people getting automatically registered, they just send it to the Division of Elections and they accept it. And that's something they told us on the record. So our data security needs to be far, far better than it is. And then processes and procedures. Good policy begins with good statutes and regulations. We have a lot of ambiguity. We end up with some poor policy. And our election integrity, in our opinion, must be statutorily driven, not determined by flexible policy. Because right now, policy can be set from one administration to the next. There's a lot of room in there to maneuver, and that's not really want, what we want to see in our election system. Let's see how we're doing for time here. Current system, just a couple things I'm going to read off to you. Based on disqualification and rejection of those ballots, so just some things that you can listen to. You can print ballots from the internet. System-wide data records are compromised. 20% more registered to vote than eligible to vote. No cure provision for those ballots. Ballot, ballot harvesting is rampant from professionals being flown up from the lower 48. Lack of a qualitative authentication methodology. No, oops, emails pop up. No protection for voting by mail or absentee. Ballot disqualification decided by politically influenced policy. One ballot, one vote, right? We want one person, one vote. It's now one ballot, one vote. What we're working on in SB 39, and like I said, folks, we started this to put everything on it so that we could have the discussion, which we've been having, and then we were going to skinny it down. We were going to make it something where everybody could have some input for this, and that's where we are. So what are we working on now? Where are we at? System design is based on three-leg stool, which I just talked to you about, multi-factor authentication, accurate and secure data, and some standardized processes and procedures. A secure database using blockchain technology. If you haven't heard of that, that's the latest thing. It's about securing data in a way that's very hard to breach. One voter, one vote. I said that at the end of the last slide there. Emphasizes local control. One of the misconceptions people are saying we're trying to take that away, we are not. Keeps all data and equipment on shore. It's one of our provisions is that everything must be made and all the equipment we use must be made in the United States. The software we use must be in, from the United States. It must be controlled, stored, everything in the United States. Why in the world, folks, we would have systems we're using for our elections that go through any other country boggles my mind. So it should be a U.S. only thing, and I think most people should be able to agree on that, I would hope. It protects cultural, geographic, and unique Alaskan conditions because we are unique, where you have very spread out villages, you have small villages that are very hard to get to that don't have the numbers to perhaps have a, uh, you know, all the voter folks that they need to work in. So we're going to, well, we would mail out in those cases. Even the lieutenant governor asked for everything below 750 people that we could just let them, uh, essentially, they can if they choose is to have mail in. If they want to have it in person, they're absolutely uh, allowed to do that. Some people thought we're trying to get rid of in-person. We're not. We're keeping in-person. We're keeping mail-in. We're keeping absentee folks. We're trying to secure the system and make it stronger. This uh, bill strengthens inclusion to assist others with voting while banning the various activity, trying to get rid of that ballot harvesting and ballot accountability. Let just keep running through in here. People try to say this is a problem, uh, a solution in search of a problem. I would disagree strongly. We wouldn't be wasting our time with this. Here's a couple of the problems it does address. Fixes weak citizenship verification, corrects insufficient cross-checking of voter roll data, stops ballot destruction in the field, which happens now, addresses the ballot chain of custody and ballot tracking, which we don't have at all, and that has been validated on the record by Division of Elections in our hearings, ensures that Division of Elections notifies voters when their ballot is questioned or rejected. We don't really do that now. Corrects the unfair limits to ID verification. Not all Alaskans have easy access to it. Trying to help with that. Resolves election irregularities live in the field, giving options for that versus waiting. Protects the rights of Alaskans to assist friends and family with the voting process. We have ways where, we, since we are going to, we want to get rid of professional ballot harvesters, but what we don't want to do is this say grandma and grandpa are stuck in a village or way out in the bush somewhere and they can't get to a poll, they can't get help. Well, now they've got maybe a grandson or somebody comes through to help them. They're absolutely we're saying, yes, you can. You can help family. What we're trying to prevent folks are professional ballot harvesters that are coming up um, and they're trying to scoop ballots up wherever they can get them. A very different thing. Uh, closes the witness signature loophole so we don't have the, let the uh, judiciary write law for us anymore like they did. It fixes the PFD concern with an opt-out provision is what we're attempting to do. It prevents counterfeit ballots, hopefully. 
Clarifies ambiguous markings, differentiating ballots and applications, because a lot of people thought they got ballots when they got applications. It gets very confusing. Ensures voting machines, uh, voting machine and data security, and eliminates unfair verification or variation, excuse me, in standards for different types of voting ballots. Uh, talk just a few more things. We have new timelines where we're giving it more time for people to be able to mail their stuff in and still be able to cure it to get questions answered before their ballot no longer counts. Uh, just a few other things. There's some new penalties we're putting in for people based on those that um, break the law. Right now, the penalties are pretty soft. We've got, if you're going to break the law, you should you should suffer the appropriate consequences, especially. And I'll go back to this, folks. We, if you really think about this, this is one of perhaps the most important civic duties we have, whether you vote or not. It really is. And when people talked about like voter suppression, which I've heard a lot of about this bill, which I hope you can speak, that's not the case. And they talk about voter disenfra disenfranchisement. A lot of what they are saying is that, well, if you have any kind of identification or anything else that makes it harder, in some ways that could be true if that's what we we're attempting to do, but it is not. We're trying to make the system more secure and actually help people get their ballots through. Um, but if you had a system that was essentially rejecting ballots, well, that's not helping people. If you have a system where it's right for error, then you know, ballots that are floating around that get sent in that, that are offsetting somebody else's legitimate vote from somebody that shouldn't be voting. So there's a lot of parts and, and pieces um, to this as we go through it. And so penalties are just one part of that, trying to make sure that um, folks that are doing things that are nefarious aren't able to do them. There are some exceptions in there, which I won't go too far into, but you know, for smaller villages, towns, municipalities, We've allowed it so that they're able to opt out, if you will. They can uh, vote in mail if they choose to. They can they can use the state system, but we're trying to ensure that the state database is right. And then if a municipality wants to use the state system, that's fine, but they have to adhere to this multi-factor authentication. In other words, they can use the data. Nothing wrong with that. We just want them to be able to make sure that it is secure, bottom line. Uh, talking about electronic voting, um, that's an issue that we've had out there. Uh, we have mail out absentee protocol for one time and recurrent absentee voting. I won't get too much in, in detail with that. Um, but here's kind of the end of the slide here for a bit. I'll kind of maybe ask questions that we can go, well, I know you want to keep going, so I'll, I'll go through that. Data breach is irrelevant if we are able to solve some of these problems. Notification to both houses of the legislature of the potential of a threat. Also notify the people. One of the things I was very upset about, folks, is that none of us knew that that data breach had occurred. And had the administration, the, ex the executive branch, announced that to the folks a week before the general election, I have a feeling a lot of people would have paid attention to the extra ballots they got, which a lot of people said they got. Uh, we would have paid attention for nefarious activities, applications, other things, ballot harvesters, taking pictures, save some paperwork. What did, what did all of us do? We're tired of the election stuff by the time it gets around to election night. We all toss it. So not knowing there was a problem until a month after the election, basically things that we could have gotten that might have helped us figure out what happened and make it better, everybody just threw that stuff away. So we're trying to get rid of the ballots being disqualified and tossed, and Alaskans are guaranteed the freedom to vote by the means they choose through statutory inclusion, giving them those options. So that's kind of, in, a, in summary, and I'm talking fast, and I understand that, of SB 39 and the things we're working on, I hope that wasn't too long, and uh, it is an effort to restore people's faith on all sides of the political spectrum back into our election system because we really do believe that it's one of the most important civic duties we have. And when you have to produce ID to write a check, to get a library book, to buy alcohol, cigarettes, other things, and yet we don't have great security in a lot of our election areas of how we do business, we feel we can do better than that. And so I hope, like I said, that that makes sense, folks, on this one. I'm going to go forward. I think, Edna, you wanted me to talk a little bit about SGR4. Um, I did work on that last year uh, with Senator Hughes. It made it to a hearing, and we had uh, basically, it's, it's back again, the time about privacy. So I think, Edna, you're moving forward, but if you want to say something, I can see you moving there. Yeah, um, yeah. go ahead and talk a little bit more on SGR4. And then um, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, SB14, the uh, judges? I'll tell you what I'll do is I will stay, I, will, I won't really touch SGR4 since that's Senator Hughes, and I know you may have her on or her. Let her let her do her thing because that's her bill. Okay. Um, but it is a it's a significant step, but a pretty small change about privacy. And the one thing I will say before I move on past her resolution is that when you can look at a state like California.
that has tighter privacy laws than Alaska. And I, I think we actually have made the loosest in the nation over what uh, people can do with your minor child without your permission. It's you ought to be pretty disturbed. And like I said, when you can look at a state like California, go California does it better than we do. That ought to raise some eyebrows. So that I'll I'll leave that where it is. If, if somebody has a specific question, I'll try to answer it. But it really, is, it really is Senator Hughes' lane, and I don't want to steal her thunder. So I'll move to Senate Bill 14. Another of the two significant pieces of legislation we're working on is Senate Bill 14. It's, it's basically um, selection of our judges, how we fill our judiciary or the judicial branch. A lot of legislators over the years have worked on changing the makeup of the Judicial Council. In Alaska, we used what's called the Missouri Plan, or the merit-based system, it's so-called. And what that is, is we select our judges through a council. It's called the Judicial Council. The Judicial Council, at this point, via the Constitution, says we'll select all judges through the Judicial Council for the Superior and the Supreme Courts, uh, Supreme Court. So for that, this Judicial Council is made up of six people, plus one. It's three attorneys, and it's three civilians. The seventh person in the tie-breaking vote is the Supreme Court Chief, Chief Justice, so another lawyer. All the lawyers member of the Alaska Bar Association. Not to get too political, but everybody tells me that the system is perfect, it works great, there's nothing wrong with it, and I would argue that's not the case because I've had a lot of what I would call conservative judges, even, and lawyers that have come forward and said we're on the right track because they don't want to turn their names in, they don't want to testify because they're afraid of of contra or, uh, retribution, but I'll tell you that's a problem with our system. When the legislative liaison for the Supreme Court is directed by the Supreme Court justices to fight a bill in the legislature, and then they try to tell me they're not political, <laughs> it's a ridiculous, it's a ludicrous statement. It's absolutely political. You look at the Alaska Bar Association, it's about two-thirds, one-thirds Democrat Republican. All the, the uh, folks inside the Bar Association that I've talked to that were considered conservative, like I said, they don't even want to put their name in. They know they're not going to get selected and it leans left. And you may be leaning left, leaning right, that's irrelevant here, but I just laugh and, and put this out as context because they try to tell me, well, it's not political. It's absolutely political. Everything in, in the government is political. So back to that Missouri plan or that merit-based plan, some states use that, like we do, where you have a trade, trade organization, ladies and gentlemen, a trade organization, the Alaska Bar Association, essentially picks who sits in one-third of your government structure, the judiciary by 2,400 lawyers. In essence, that's essentially what happens. And there's been at least 19 times that we're aware of in all of the times that they select judges where when you had a tie between those three lawyers and the three civilians, guess who picked up um, that, that last, that seventh vote and broke it? The Supreme Court Chief Justice, those 19 times sided with the lawyers. So it absolutely does happen where the lawyers can control it, have controlled it, but the most disturbing part is I ask you, where is your representation from the people? Right? Our government is of, by, and for the people. Except, apparently, the Alaska Bar Association and the Alaska Judiciary, because it's picked by lawyers. So this would be no different, folks, the analogy I have used is imagine if your legislators got together every couple of years and said, we get to pick, not you, we're gonna pick who the next legislator stars. There would be a, a riot, there would be a rebellion. But nobody seems to have a problem with the uh, judiciary being picked by, um, essentially, from amongst themselves. So the Judicial Council picks those names, they vet them, they send them to the governor, it's generally two names, and the governor gets to pick from that. That's it, there's nothing else, there's no other recourse, no other choice, that's what you've got. And when you look at the Constitution, like I said before, we're superior Supreme Court judges, judges must be picked. We discovered over the last year doing research that we're taking a different tack because right out of the Constitution, it says all of the other courts are essentially as established by the legislature. We can and should have been picking the magistrates, the appellate courts, and the district courts, and we, we contend that we should be doing that. So what we have done is create Senate Bill 14. And what that allows is now we have essentially the same structure where names are forwarded, right? And those names are forwarded, they go to the, um, the governor, and the Judicial Council still get to pick. And the, we had four for the Judicial Council, two for the governor. So now we've expanded the choices, we've given more choice. We've got up to six names to choose from, now, once those names are chosen, the Judicial Council still does the vetting, still does the voting on those names, and then they forward them. And whoever survives that process, process and gets forwarded, the governor picks from that. If the governor picks, and you go, well, I don't know if it's a left judge or, or a left lawyer, or excuse me, I can't get the right names, governor, a Democrat, Republican, it's irrelevant because you have a, a balance here. And the balance is now that in this, the final cross-check, 
is that like many other states that use a blended system, not just this Missouri-based and merit-based system, is you have a, a cross-section. So you would have those judges or those uh, folks selected, they'd go to governor, you'd pick the names, but now for those lower courts, your judicial, your legislature, I'm sorry, I'm mixing a lot of terms here tonight, your legislature gets an up or down vote. So that happens in California and many other states, again, where you get an up or down vote. When I say you, that's what I mean. Right now, you don't get that voice. Right now, the people that make those decisions are unaccountable to you, other than the governor, but all he gets to do is pick a name. Now, in the lower courts at least, which is the best we can probably do for now, is the representatives of the people, that would be you, now have a voice through your elected, elected legislators, which there's 60 of us instead of one governor or just seven people on a judicial council, and we can have an up or down vote. So if it's a really far left, far right, you name the candidate, the legislature will hopefully be a very balanced cross-check and representation or represent the people and approving those judges. That was a long conversation there, and I apologize, it usually looks better. I probably should have figured out a way to put a graph up. But bottom line, folks, is right now, if I bottom lined it, the Judicial Council and the Alaska Bar Association picks your judges, period. We are providing a system where at least the lower courts in the state would still be picked by essentially the same people, but we are expanding the pool, and we are allowing the legislature to have an up or down vote on those candidates so that you would actually be able to have some representation from people that are accountable to you, your legislators. If we start approving judges that have a bad record, we're the ones that are going to take the heat. And that's okay. That's the way it should work. So, um, uh, Edna, there is SB 39, there is SB 14. We should probably stop there for questions since it's 743. I know we started a bit late, but that's 35 minutes or so and probably good enough. I can talk about any other bills, any questions, happy to answer them. It's probably better to let people do this anyway, so I'm not just speaking without um, specific gonna, points. Are we going to flip so he can see, or are we going to continue this way? He can see already. He, you can see, so when people ask, he can see when he asks questions. Can you see all of us? Yeah, so he's talking, I didn't hear anything. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. Can you see all of us? So, so you I have an idea? Okay. I see little tiny people, yes. Okay. Who, who can you see? Can you see me pretty well? I can. You're about a quarter of an inch high, but I can absolutely see you. So if I come closer, can you see? Am I half? If I half, have, have I grown? You've grown a little bit. You're getting bigger. So okay. I can help okay. you there. So why don't we have people maybe line up so and he can, uh, Senator Shower can have an idea? Well, I think we're going to have people line up, but yeah, stay. Uh, yeah. And we're going to do just questions, okay? We don't want to hear how bad the election was in the last uh, dozen years or so like that. So, yeah, so come on up, Abby. And uh, so just questions. Uh, let me ask you a really hot political question. Okay, you ready? If you if you would have been the lieutenant governor, would you have followed the judges' for, uh, decision, or would you have told him or her rather that no, you were going to follow the state law? It's I, I will tell you what I think, and it's always hard, right? Because we all get to be armchair quarterbacks. So to be fair to those that in position at the time, it's never as simple or as easy as you want to make it out to be. Uh -huh. I will tell you my position. Generally speaking, and uh, as you well know, most people, hopefully your audience do, is I believe we follow the law, right. even if we don't like it. I have a problem with judges that override the law, especially when it specifically states and the, either the statutes or constitution, it is the purview of the legislature only to do that and not the courts. So I would hope that my decision would have been two things. One, that the executive branch is the one that enforces the law. The courts give us opinions, and if we believe there's an issue, you continue to follow the law until you resolve it. And I don't, I don't believe that in this case it was appropriate for that decision. And that gets into a balance between the, the two branches, the separation of powers, and, and a broader and deeper discussion. That the second thing is that was really important is we should have informed the public, and we didn't do that. Because we had a problem. But both of those are issues for me. So there you go. Okay. okay. Something. I appreciate you letting me put you on the hot seat. Okay. Questions only. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Becca. Um, I heard you say a couple times that um, you were going to start with the lower courts. Is there a reason we can't just um, try to do a bill that covers all the courts? 
good question, and I will thank you for that. I, I tried to, I didn't want to spend too much time on it, but I will explain that hopefully briefly. So if you read our Constitution, there's a very you know, small section about the uh, judicial branch, the judiciary. And in that, it says very specifically that the superior and supreme courts must go through that judicial council process as it is set up. To change that, it takes a constitutional change, to change our Constitution. What we have discovered is the lower courts can be done statutorily. Now, briefly, let me explain why that matters and why this is hard to do. For many years, a lot of legislators have tried to change that judicial council makeup, how it works. And that's a constitutional change. That you need. To get two thirds of the body of 60 legislators to agree to do that is very hard. However, we are doing this statutorily. Statutorily only requires 11 senators and 21 House members. It's a much lower bar to meet. And by the way, it meets the constitutional requirements because people have said how great the constitution is, how well it was written. It was, the framers knew exactly what they were doing. But they get mad at me for trying to assert legislative authority that's right in the same constitution that says we should be appointed lower courts. I find the hypocrisy fascinating. That is why I hope that could make sense that it is a very hard thing to do constitutionally. It's been tried and so far has failed. So we're trying a different tact. And to put those together won't work because one of those is a constitutional change and the, this other one is statutory. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, my other question would be, um, so we're not obviously appointing judges, but you're trying to give us the opportunity to give us representation, but we do get to vote whether they stay or go. Retention. Correct, so other states, some other states actually elect their judges. Uh, they have different processes for that if you look across all 50 states. However, in Alaska, there is no election for a judge. It is only retention, as you said, and so, Unfortunately, there's almost never a judge that does not survive or is uh, unelected is not the right word or some struggling for the word, but there's almost never a judge that is not retained is the word I'm looking for. So you get a judge in place and like all things in politics, incumbents become very hard to kick out. In addition to that, when you look at how the commission writes the reports and they use taxpayer dollars to do it, which is a question upon itself that we're doing that, to talk about judges' reports. It's always glowing reports. There's never anything bad said about them. And so you get very little data for people to look at. I mean, what do you know about your judges? I would ask the group then out in the room, what do you know about your judges? Most people don't know anything about them because yeah. they do their job over there quietly and nobody ever talks about it unless it's a really big issue. And so they simply just get retained over and over and over again. And nobody has ever had a chance through you, the people, to have any input into that until they have been retained many years later after they were appointed by unaccounted or unelected and unaccountable officials. Hope that makes sense. She's going to hold it. Yeah. Okay. First, thank you for your attention to the Alaska Constitution. That's important. So don't let anybody uh, bash you about about that. Okay. Now, here's my uh, first question. Your uh, SB 14 about. Uh, Judicial, um, uh, judicial appointments and so forth. Uh, the, the same theories that you have there, are you planning to extend uh, the involvement of the citizenry in more in retention voting than there is now? For example, I'm not gonna make a, a big issue, but let's say uh, uh, you have these guys, instead of just depending on the judicial council, have them write a summary justifying their, uh, some of their decisions that is publicized everywhere so people can look to see what their thinking is. Can you tell me about that? Sir, you asked an excellent question. It's one that's come up recently in the last few months of, as we've gone through this. We have a very highly esteemed and experienced judge, lawyer and judge from the lower 48. I won't say name or state. I'm not sure that's I'm supposed to. but. Um, was very clear with us that he actually believes that Alaska's current system for how we talk about judges and put their data in the election pamphlet is highly unconstitutional. He believes if anyone was to challenge it that we would find it to be an unconstitutional act of where we use taxpayer dollars to essentially re-elect someone, if you will. So in answer to your question, it's something that has come up more recently as we have gone through SB 14 and had various conversations with legal scholars and others around the country. And we have not at this point come up to a resolution, if you will, in the office of how we might address that. I will only want to tell you that we realize it's something that now needs to be addressed that we hadn't even considered before. So we are looking at various ways 
um, that we might do that because we believe it has to be driven probably statutorily. The legislature is going to have to say something, say this is what you're going to do from now on. And if we don't give that guidance, it simply won't happen. Because we've noticed that if you, you folks that have been around for a long time can see that, if the legislature does not, does not specifically say something will be done or shall be done, typically it's not going to be done. Thank you. I have one other question and I'm gonna release the floor. Um, on your uh, SB 34, um, since you've brought it to attention, there are constitutional issues on some, some of these, like the judge, you know, judge selection and so forth. Have you looked into um, variations from uh, or problems that arise because the Constitution says one thing and you got a contradiction in the law and how uh, uh, things are treated as far as election integrity? So far, and I will say so far, with everything that we do when we draft a bill, everybody has to do this. It goes through legislative legal, which is our unbiased, objective lawyer group, if you will, that advised us the legislature helps write bills, etc. And everything we have seen so far, in their opinion, because we get them, and sometimes they'll come back and say, if it's something, I filed a whole other bill, what well, we're getting ready to maybe file it, and we got it back from the drafters today. This is a rabbit hole, but it, you'll know what I mean in a second. And they said, oh, we think this is unconstitutional, not the other bills we're talking about, this is a separate bill. Said, this and this and this and this. And we sent back a one liner and said, is anything in the bill you think is not unconstitutional? It was a little bit of a joke, um, but I say that for this context that they will always tell us if they believe something is going to have a constitutional challenge or it's got precedent that was set somewhere else, et cetera. So far in the election bill that I have, SB 39, um, we have not seen that from any of the drafters. Any of the things they've given us for opinions do not say if this is unconstitutional or that might be or this broaches that law. It's one more of the, uh, the misconceptions that have been spread by people about the bill is that it's going to do this, that, and the other. Well, the people that draft the bills that do this for a living so far have not given that to us. And any areas we had that might have been contentious or might have even gotten, say, sued by a municipality, we have taken those out. Um, because we wanted to have the discussion. So I know a longer answer to your short question, but um, so far we're not seeing it. And I don't think we have those. This is about making it better, not about doing things that would be unconstitutional. And, and the data is backing us up at this point. Thank you very much. Uh, I misstated my, my question, obviously. Uh, there is a, a supreme principle of both the U.S. and Alaska constitutions about uh, people having equal treatment under the law. I would say you should uh, I was going to ask if you looked into that aspect as a support for uh, your bill. Uh, yes, we have, and since we kind of went down that, it would not take too much time up, we have, and the this will take longer to go into that, so I'll probably defer. As a matter of fact, if you would like, this may be the easiest answer, if you could send us an email to our office, just the, you know, send it, uh, Mike Shower, you can look it up online, pull it up. We have some pretty good, uh, uh, data on that, and I would ask Scott Ogan to uh, forward that back to you. It might be easier to get into that conversation. It is something we have absolutely discussed. Thank you. I'm done. Yes, I appreciate your attention and willingness to answer questions. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Mike. Uh, my name is William Gilbert, and I've got a question about the uh, you know the voter certification bill. The opposite side is going to just say, you just want to suppress voters. That's their slogan. Do you have a slogan? Do we have a case, a good case, like several other, Illinois, Nevada, and so on. They found people that have really messed, messed up and have done illegal stuff. Do we have any good examples you can use to kind of rally uh, vote, uh, legislators, state legislators who aren't really committed one way or another, uh, to your side, uh, so that uh, they, you know, voter suppression, yeah, that's not so good, but Mike Shower's got a really good example of what we want to prevent. Have we got any examples like that? We do have some, and, and you heard me brief, we haven't put them out yet because this is a very long process. We've been, like I said, working on this for years. But this last election cycle has kind of solidified it for me that we need to do something to make people, to restore people's faith. So we're coming up with those. That PowerPoint brief that I was briefing off of earlier has some of those things in there that we're working on for slogans. I, I know what you're saying. And I would comment that, you know, the, one of the oldest political tricks in the book, maybe oldest tricks in the book, right, is if you can't destroy the message, destroy the messenger. 
So it's not that, you know, oh, this bill is all bad, it's that, uh, you know, Mike Shower is a white supremacist or a racist, and I've been called that by people down in Anchorage and, and in the press and others, so I get it. Um, but we are working on that very thing, and we have not launched that yet, but yes, to answer your question, and I don't know if slogan would be the right way to say it, but we have the data to show what we're doing. And a poor example of that, sir, is when we talk about now ballot rejection versus ballot qualification. That's a big deal because people right now realize, oh, my ballot can get rejected for anything. We're not going to do that. We're going to allow your ballot to be authenticated so your vote counts. But we, it's how we sell it. So to answer your question, we are working on that, and we are going to come up with, for lack of a better term, the media blitz so we can get the information out. The, the people that oppose the bill have, have spun up their, you know, their groups, their email chains, mostly unions and, and a lot of other types of groups have done this. But I think they also understand that, you know, hey, if we are going to tighten up our election system and they can't, uh, you know, flood the market with ballots, it's not necessarily going to work out in their favor. That's what the argument seems to be, because I'm trying to figure out how we're suppressing votes when we're not doing that at all. So, again, long answer to your question. We haven't done much of that yet because we've been letting it percolate through the system and trying to get it to a place that I think is pragmatically passable in this very difficult building. And we are going to be doing that soon because we want to do exactly what you said. We want people to see the other side of the story, that it is not the things they've said it is, but do it with facts and information that is both hopefully a little bit entertaining, but also easy to read and digestible. Again, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I, I think, okay, slogan may be not the best way, but an example. Get a good example. It's going to stick in their heads. <laughs> Yes, sir. I, I hear you loud and clear. We are working on that very thing. Good evening, Senator Shower. Thank you for uh, taking the time to speak with us tonight. My name is Gordon DeVries, and I just wanted to ask you a quick question about SB 39. Um, when you talked about multi-factor authentication, uh, that seemed, you know, pretty good. Um, but my question is, um, why mail-in voting when we've got an absentee ballot system? There's a couple things that are different, and without getting in too far into what I would call the weeds as a pilot, we can get down low and fly into the details. So you have a couple different things. So absentee uh, ballot is a person, for example, that is, and they could be in the state, they could be somewhere in the state if you're a trucker driving a long haul world. I had a guy tell me that over the weekend, that you know, he drives and he wants to get his absentee ballot, so when he comes home, he's sitting in the mail for him to you know, fill it out and send it down. There is the other side of this that is mail-in voting only. And when you do that, typically what we're, and I'm, I'm kind of giving it in the broadest terms, um, absentee people request it. You go, hey, I want an absentee ballot because I'm gonna be gone, I'm out of state, I'm military, whatever it is. The mail-in voting, what's typically being talked about in that case is let's say Juno and Anchorage, which are doing it, we are going to shotgun mail out ballots to everybody, everybody. And we are not going to check when they come back. You know, we have these different problems because the state data is not right. So if they're using, guess what? They're using the state data and those from those databases. So we already know we have a problem. And so you're just sending them out to every address, every person, and there's no uh, request, if you will, for that. So that's kind of the difference in answering your question. And it's one of the things you said. Well, you know what? Here's the deal. If you're going to do that, then if we need to secure the chain of custody, we need to have multi-factor authentication so that we are not mailing out, and by the way, we need to clean up the voter rolls, right? So that we're only sending out ballots to real people that should have them, and we know who got the ballot, we know that they sent it back, and we can track it. And by the way, we have it there so you can track it. Like we said as a joke, is that if Domino's can track your pizza, why can't we track your ballot? Come on, we can do better than that. So uh, there may be more to your question, but I, I know that's at least at the top level. Yeah, that was, that was essentially it. Um, I mean, I know that that's basically many people's concern with the mail-in system is what you just said when we have an absentee ballot system in place but with both those systems obviously they're using the mail so the authentication is important so maybe the reality is mail-in balloting won't go away maybe that's too big of a fight to to place but either way that authentication piece that you talked about is obviously very important so thank you for pursuing this legislation you are correct, just to, to follow up on that as a final tie, you, it's a tough thing when a lot of the country is going to mail ballots, and there may even be a time and crisis where you might want to do that. However, if we're going to do that, we believe the most elegant solution is you secure it so that we make sure we have that authentication of the person, 
we know who it is, et cetera, et cetera, all the things I've said without repeating them, so that if we're going to mail out ballots, if we're going to have absentee ballots, if we're going to allow you to get an online ballot sent to you in the mail or in the email and you print it, then we ought to be authenticating and tracking it so we know. Once we do that, I think most of us that would you know, almost prefer to see all paper ballots hand counted again to get rid of all these problems. Well, if you can have more faith that you know at least it's gonna be one person and one vote because we've secured the system, I think we can all go, okay, we can live with that. Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Nick Brockett, and um, I've got a tough question for you. <clears throat> um, our country and our way of life depends on our liberty, and the government is supposed to serve the people. The hinge pin of that is our elections. Okay? If they are compromised in such a way that the system becomes broken, and it's not capable of fixing itself the way it's designed, at what point do we say it can't be fixed in the way that we're approaching it? Because I believe it's very broken when people vote who don't even exist, okay? The opposition to your bill or any bill that wants to fix it is at this point pretty powerful. And those people who are in office who got there because the system is broken are the ones that's going to be the opposition to you. Can this be overcome? Thank you. Wow, Nick, you know, the good news is you always ask me such easy questions. <laughs> um, I wish I could hear your laughter in the room, hope there'd be some. So you're asking a question that we could probably spend an entire hour talking about, and what I will tell you is, and you guys that know me in the room say, I don't sugarcoat anything, I don't know. I don't know if we have passed the point where we are um, watching our republic slip through our fingers, as one of our founders talked about, you have a republic if you can keep it. I don't know if it is possible to reverse the course of some things that I think are less than optimum, like all mail-in voting without secure chain of custody and validation of the votes, et cetera, or the, the ballots, et cetera. I don't know. Um, you know, uh, are we modern day Rome? We could be, well, looking at the amount of corruption that we all know exists, and often it seems like one of the biggest problems is those that are the, the biggest perpetrators of the, of the corruption get off scot-free. It's like if you have enough money and you know people, well, you're good to go. Well, the little people, the rest of us, including me, you know, we're worried about breaking a speeding limit or you know, paying our property taxes. So, Nick, you're asking very salient questions, and there are things that are quite honestly more broad. And I'm gonna mention a name here that makes some people's heads explode, the former President Trump. Love him, hate him, voted for him, not, doesn't matter. Here's my point, um, and I hope people will take this in context. Regardless of your view of him and where things sat up on all of the political spectrum, if a person that comes in that is a multi-billionaire trying to execute their version of an agenda of what can happen um, at the most, probably the most powerful position, executive position on the planet, and can only do things through executive orders for a few years, and then as soon as that person's gone, the next person comes in and just undoes everything and changes it. And you can't outlast the bureaucrats that are there for 30 or 40 or 50 years who hold a lot of power. That's why this becomes one of the reasons this becomes so problematic. How do you fix that? And I don't know. Governments have become exceedingly large, they are exceedingly powerful. I am not anti-government, I have, a, we all, I think most of us agree we need some form of government for certain things, but I think a lot of us, especially on the conservative side or the libertarian side, are concerned that governments have gotten too big and too powerful. And, you know, as the saying also goes, you know, a government strong enough to give you everything is strong enough to take it away from you. So those are things that every patriot should always be on guard for, every Christian, every patriot, um, that we let liberty slip through our fingers when we should be fighting for it. That can be from health mandates that I know have been a to hot topic in the last year and things that have happened that way, the lack of due process, you know, an alcohol store being allowed to stay open while a mom and pop shop is shut down and loses everything. So we have issues, folks, and we certainly have them from the federal government all the way to international things happen around the planet, and I see it as a FedEx pilot often enough, all the way back down to here um, at the local level. So 
I apologize for a three, four minute diatribe there. I don't know how to answer that question, Nick. It is too big, it is too broad. And quite honestly, my personal faith in Jesus Christ, and I hope that's okay to say in a church, is about all I got going for me right now because this is much bigger than one person. And uh, good luck. Hi, my name is Melissa, and I was just going to ask, I wasn't sure if I caught that you said SB 39. Does it address the um, Dominion voting system in Alaska? It does, and I'll tell you how we did that, because um, Dominion is just another part of the battle. A lot of people are upset about it. It's, there's proof of this and that, and then the other people say it's fine. And here's my position on it. Not getting wrapped around the axle about Dominion machines in and of themselves, what I believe is, is that U.S. elections should use U.S.-based machines, U.S.-based software. They should be run and, and they should be on servers that are located in the United States, not by other countries. So we are addressing it in the bill by having a section that says all Alaska elections will use U.S. made equipment, software, U.S. servers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, no foreign influence. So, because I believe that's something that's important, regardless of what happened at Dominion. We shouldn't be handing over elections to anybody to run. You know, that just doesn't make sense at all to me. You think the Chinese are going to allow a U.S. company to run their elections? Ha! Ah, of course they aren't. So why would we do it? We can do better. So I hope that answers your question. That's a nice short one for James. Thank you. Hi, Senator Shower, Bert here. Um, got several multi-part questions for you. One of them is we got the recent Biden's executive order that he just signed to expand registration and uh, access for voters. Is this in any way going to be affecting the uh, at a state level versus a national level? In regards also talking about the, the Capitol there and what they've done is they got HR1. Um, which is one of the most corrupt voter bills that I've ever seen in existence, especially when it's going to allow illegal aliens and convicted felons that are sitting currently in jail to be able to have access to be able to vote in our voting system. Is anything that we do on a state level, let's say the bills that you're working on, uh, SB 39 and SJR uh, 14, are either one of those going to have any way to be able to quash those kind of bills if they do get passed? And then my final question for you will be, I know the first one was kind of packed there. The, the, the last one is, is, is our um, SJR 14, I, I like to call it the DC model or the, the capital model of being able to pick judges and uh, where you get a big huge list, the governor gets to choose from the list here, I want this and this person to go in front of, to fill these different positions in front of the Senate and the Senate sits down and they do confirmation hearings on voting on them instead of doing what we currently do. Uh, is uh, who is your biggest opposition and us as your constituents, what can we do to counter your opposition, which happens to be the judicial branch themselves and places like the NWACP coming out calling this a voter suppression bill and uh, or basically racist depending upon the term that you want to throw out there for the bills that you have currently in front of us. Well, you know, you understand there, my friend, you, you, you do have, like, Memorex here. There's only still on my memory goes before I start dropping things off. <laughs> but I will try to answer those as best I can. You might have to reframe one of those or so, but I'll start at the big back side. And those that watch my Facebook, if you haven't, I did an entire uh, Facebook Live on SB 14 where we talked about how the federal government uses it, how other places use it, what I'm continuing to do. And so the biggest opposition is no doubt going to be the judiciary on SB 14 for electing or, or selecting our judges. And that's going to be a big deal because, they, like I said, they've already had the reports. Uh, the liaison is fighting it, directed by the Supreme Court justices to fight it. We've had all the legal groups, many from the Alaska Bar Association, that, no, it's fine, it's fine, there's nothing to see here. Well, of course they're going to say that because they don't want us touching their empire. That's their empire. They want to be able to select their own people and have their own little thing going. So I understand it. Um, I understand the resistance to it, but it's mostly going to come from the judiciary, the Alaska Bar Association, and groups like that. Um, those that like Planned Parenthood speaking out, you go, what's Planned Parenthood talking about Senate Bill 14 election judges? Well, they want left-leaning judges that would support abortion on demand, et cetera, et cetera. Or so you can see where certain groups would be lined up um, or any social justice or you know, name your topic and you can see a group and understand why it either is for or against the bill. And so that's where the most of this opposition is going to come from. Going back to um, the beginning, and goodness gracious, start me over again in the beginning. Don't tell me the whole question. Just give me one part of a second. Snap my brain off here. Biden's executive order. <laughs> you asked two questions at once. 
Uh, you got Biden's executive order that he just signed. It would be the first part. Okay. So thank you. So here's the thing on HR1. I did a Facebook Live Friday night this past week if you want to go see a little bit about that. That almost 800 page bill. Here's the thing I'll say about that is that for HR1, um, I will be shocked if it makes it through its legal challenges. Now here's the thing. When you look at that bill, it actually, I, I'm shocked that, <laughs> I can't believe they put this in there. It basically tells the judicial branch, the federal judicial branch, that uh, we have oversight of you in the legislature now, and we're going to tell you how to rule. Because it says that they're going to have a commission, and they're going to go in and, and they're going to watch their behavior, make sure they rule correctly on their opinions. I go, you have got to be kidding me. Um, and then on top of that, they can pull them in front of the, the uh, Congress. They can pull them in front of them for questioning. Like, they can basically grill them. And you go, that's not separation of powers at all. So I will be highly surprised. Now, they've tried to get rid of it. The sneaky, in this case, I am going to say Democrats, because this is not a Republican thing right now. The sneaky little Democrats in the Senate and the House wrote this at the federal level. I'm not talking state. At the federal level, so that it says that all of the court cases, if there is constitutional challenges to that H.R. 1 bill in the U.S. House, that they must go through District 1. They must go through the District of Columbia. Now, isn't that something that, that those judges, almost every one of them was appointed by a leftist Democrat. So they're going to take they're going to say in law that you can't you know, try it in any of the other circuit courts around the country. You must go to Washington, D.C. and that one court to be able to challenge the law. That alone is highly unconstitutional. So how they're going to do this and this bill survives the challenge, I don't know. But it is an absolutely terrible bill. The things you said about it are correct. Um, I will tell you that uh, from a state level to answer the second part of your question, is that the federal supremacy laws have been upheld often by the Supreme Court and others. So if we do things at the state level, we might get rolled. That's true. However, there is a silver lining, which we have verified so far, that when they're saying H.R. 1 and it, it applies to elections, because basically what they're doing stuff, folks, is they're shoving this down our throats. They're saying, we don't care that there's 50 different states and that the people are different, the circumstances are different. What they're telling us is that one size fits all. And whatever works in Florida, works in Texas, in California, in New York, in Alaska, we don't care. We're going to make you have elections this way. But we believe it seems like it's going to apply to the federal elections. If that's the case, folks, the answer for us will be we'll hold state elections separately on our own. And we'll just pick a different day. Because they can't, the best we can tell, and I believe it has been wrapped up by the Supreme Court as we're working our way through it, because yeah, this is a relatively new development, is that the courts have been reticent to tell a state how to run its own state elections. So we might get rolled by federal supremacy for federal elections, as bad as that is, but I believe we may still have recourse in being able to at least elect our own state representatives, senators, uh, you know, local elections, et cetera. I, again, long answer, because that was a really big question. I might have missed one part of that, but hopefully that's most of it. Well, there's, there's only one last piece. What can us, as your constituents, do to back you up, make your two bills get pushed through. I, I, I mean, I call in, you know me, you, you've already heard my voice more than once this year calling in and giving testimony. Um, what else can we do? Uh, I mean, do emails work? Do we need to be contacting the Bar Association, our judicial branch? What do we need to do to, to make this more of a, a limelight and in the focus because our mainstream media is, is putting this as what I had said table NWACP has called it. It's a voter suppression bill that's racist. Um, and that's the basic consistence that I'm hearing from our mainstream media. And, and I know it's anything but, so. <laughs> we will continue to get that. And so what I would ask people that agree that we can do better and that we need to see some uh, improvements in our election system, some improvements to the way we select our judges, is those individual groups and, and the, that side of the spectrum, if you will, have spun up all their contact lists. So we still get, you know, we've gotten hundreds and hundreds of emails opposing SB 39 and dozens, it's not as many as SB 14 because most people don't know and don't care. Um, but it just, just all kinds of emails and we've gotten from all over the country. I've got people say, as an Alaskan, and then I look at the residents in Arizona, it's New York. I'm like, yeah, it's in Alaska. Okay, check, whatever. Because they, they spun up their, their contact list, right? They've got millions of people on their contact list, unions and the NAACP, ACLU, Planned Parenthood, you name it. And they've spun up their list. So if you're in the room and you have friends and social networks and others that believe that what we're doing is the right thing, then we need to see that. So I normally say don't use emails that influence your legislator. Pick up the phone and call them or see them at a town hall like this because it's direct contact and that matters. Voice inflections, seeing people look them in the eye, shake their hand, 
That's a big deal. But you don't always get to do that. This is a little bit of a different case because we are getting inundated in the legislature by these massive contact lists and groups that are trying to shut this effort down. It should make somebody go, hmm, why would they not want to make our election um, a little bit tighter, our election system? So if you support what we're doing, then in this case, we need mass email lists too. We need groups of hundreds and hundreds of people uh, and get the church alive, folks. I mean, we're talking to the church here, I mean, we're kind of watching it, and spin them up and get people to write letters and say, even form letters are great in this case because they just need to see support over. I support SB39, I support SB39, I support it, I support it, I support it. We need to see that because the other side is hitting us every day with SB39, I oppose it, it's voter suppression. Well, if we don't have as many good Alaskans that support the effort sending that data in, it gets real hard because the legislators start to get concerned that people are, too many people are against it, and guess what, they're not gonna vote for it. Because ultimately, folks, I'm here to tell you, what most of your legislators care most about is getting that seat back. And I don't mean they're all bad people in that sense. I'm talking when it comes to this type of stuff of their votes and accountability, they don't want to do something that's controversial. They want to do things so they can safely keep their seat. That's the way it works. You just need to understand that. So long answer, but if we could get people that support the effort to uh, mass email, make phone calls, et cetera, et cetera, call into the newspaper, write op-eds, media blitz, as the gentleman asked me earlier about you know getting people to understand why it matters, that I could use help with. I hope that makes sense. It does. Thank you. Hi, Mike. I have a quick question. Our rank um, choice voting, uh, how is that going to affect some of what you're working on? Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I don't know. This is a, pardon the, the French here, but this isn't really French, I'm just kidding. So I'm just, Part of me wants to say a bad word once in a while. Sometimes I find myself regressing to my fighter pellet mode in this new job I have. It's very frustrating at times. It's a chocolate mess. I'll put it that way. Um, we don't know how ballot measure two is going to affect this. We know that it's, if any of you have not seen it, the Division of Elections put out a, a primer, what it will, may look like on it. And it is, it looks like an engineering diagram, folks. It's like, here's your ranked choices and your jungle primary, and here's all the names, and chip this button, and that one, and write in you know, different numbers for, is this your first choice, second choice? There, who in the world is gonna do that? It's hard enough getting people to come in and put you know, bubbles on it and put it in a machine. It's gonna be a mess, folks. I'm telling you that right now. And the way this works out is, unfortunately, what I see is this is no longer going to be about a person's policy or position. It's gonna be about how you work the numbers to get elected on election night. Because if you don't get 50% plus one of the vote, then they're going to take the votes off the bottom of a lot. They're going to redistribute those with some algorithm. And they're going to go to the next one, the next one, until somebody gets it. And for those of you that haven't heard the story, to give you an idea of what nightmare this may be for us, to include Lisa Burkowski getting reelected, um, and maybe not a nightmare for everybody, but a lot of people are upset about that, <laughs> is that if you look in Maine, there was a Republican for, I think it was U.S. Senate, don't hold me to that, and they did not get 50% of the vote. They don't have top four rank four. We're the only place in the country now with that. They only had top two. And so they had a runoff. And when they had some fallout on the bottom and redid the, the algorithm, the Republican on the night of the election got like, I don't know, 46% of the vote. The Democrat got like 42% of the vote, whatever it was. By the time they were done doing the rank of choice part and all that calculation, guess who's sitting in that seat right now? It's not the Republican that won the majority of the vote. It's the Democrat. So this bill is designed to move the candidates, move more moderate people to the center or to the left when you look at how it works out. So uh, I know that was a short question, and I, don't, I hate when I can't tell you folks answers, but I'm also not going to try to blow smoke. I don't know how this is going to work out. I am somewhat horrified that the next election cycle, next November, is going to be very ugly, and we are going to regret this. Uh, for what happened, and it's and I'll be honest with you folks, it's our fault. We should have been more engaged and we weren't. We should have been fighting this from the very beginning. And, and we, including myself, legislators, people, activists, etc., we got into this fight too late, didn't put enough into it, and we're going to suffer the consequences. So I guess we'll see where it goes. Sorry, which I had a better answer. <laughs> this is part two of that. My name is uh -oh. Nancy, and I, I understood that ballot measure two was um, not even constitutional with our state constitution. Is that correct? Don't know. That hasn't been worked. That hasn't worked through the court case yet to get that um, uh, that adjudicated. I would tell you, with the current makeup of the court, I would be very surprised based on how they've ruled so far in everything to do with elections. 
that they would give us that kind of relief. My guess is if this was to go before our Supreme Court, they would uh, argue that it was absolutely constitutional and probably say so. And I know that's not the answer you would like to hear. I would guess that that is exactly what they would say about it. Unfortunately, sorry, yeah, not a great answer. Thanks, Nancy. So, anyone, yeah, Margaret? Anyone else? We've got a few more Thank minutes. you for your patience, folks. You guys are doing great. I sit there on Monday night. Uh -huh. So good to see you here. I really appreciate your time. Um, I'm just wondering if um, a forensic review could be made of the, the voting machines on ballot measure two and have it overturned. Has anybody thought about that? There are people talking about that. To be uh, quite frank, I am not involved in those discussions, uh, only because, and I think you will understand this, and you know, and we've talked to you often enough, with Michelle and whatnot, and we are pedaling in this office about as fast as we can pedal. I'm taking on two of the more contentious issues in the entire legislature right now as, as an office. We have some support from others and other legislators, but we're, we're running lead on this, and they are tough issues, and they're gonna be hard to get past, and we are, focusing a good portion of our efforts. Now we have to multitask, we all do here. We're working very hard on the budget. We're still trying to find a solution, a long-term solution for the budget as far as the PFT, spending cap, other things that matter. Um, but I say all that in context, I think that, was that Margaret? Yeah, I think it was, right, it was. Um, yeah. So I say that in the context of this is that some people are looking at that. The answer to your question of whether or not it can be done, it might be able to be done. But why I have a lack of faith in that is because I've heard the word right out of the Lieutenant Governor's mouth that go, hey, we looked at it, everything is good. We don't think there's any problem there. And if that's the position the administration is going to take, we probably will make no headway with the makeup then of this legislative body and the old guard and the House now being controlled by the Democrats. Thank you very much, Representative Kelly Merrick, for throwing us all under the bus um, of getting any progress. So again, I hate to be the bearer of all the bad news. I'd like to make it all some happier, but it is, it's not the prettiest picture right now. And I would rather all of you know exactly what is happening and be prepared for it than for me to tell you how everything is awesome. And then you wonder why nothing happens. I'd rather you know the truth because I hope that makes you angry enough to keep you engaged. I'll be quite frank folks, what I don't see is enough people being engaged until it hits you in the wallet and then people get mad like the PFD. Um, or it directly affects you, and then people get mad and they get involved. They only get involved for a little bit, and then we always forget, and when it comes to election cycle or something else, and we kind of back off and go back to living our lives, especially conservatives, Christians, others, we're terrible. The church is terrible at this. I don't mean your church, I mean the church. We're not involved enough. If we sit back and we get angry for a little while, while the other side marches to the tomb like good soldiers, and they don't stop, ever. And so one of the problems we have, folks, and I'm saying this from my personal philosophy, is that we tend to not engage enough and we let it happen. And then we wonder why the Anchorage Assembly looks like it would fit better in Berkeley, downtown San Francisco, than in Anchorage, Alaska. And yet that's exactly what we have. So engagement matters, my friends. And I would I hope that you will stay um, involved enough, upset enough about what's happening to be engaged in the process. And even if you're on the other side of the spectrum, it's irrelevant. People need to be engaged in the process. And we don't. Yes, I had a question regarding the elections. Will you still be using the Diebold machines? I don't know. Uh, I don't know the answer to that because we would have to get the bill passed and then see what options would be available from U.S.-based companies only. Yeah, because if the Diebold machines are still being used, then it really doesn't matter what you do. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Because it's... they control the votes. You, none of us will control the votes without totally, completely control the votes as, as long as they're using the Diebold machines. That is that is an area that we have to take up with this, but I will, and you're not going to like this answer either. Well, you don't like much of what I say, and anybody does, but you, baby steps. I've got to get, the, we've got to get something like this passed first that gives us the policy options to be able to change and buy and do different things. Where we sit right now, we don't have it. We don't have the ability to do it until we can change it. And it's got to say something that limits what we can get. And right now, we don't have that in statute at all. Sorry for another great answer. <laughs> you guys are asking some good, hard questions. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Colonel. Uh, Super Dave from Palmer. 
Uh, you're still invited to our Marine Corps muster every Tuesday morning in Vagabond Blues at 0900. Anytime to show up. And also, what do you think of the Marine Corps' new fighter pilot maternity flight suit? Uh, I am not going to comment on that without getting myself in trouble. So I think, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming, man. Number five. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, last. Oh, he got another email, so. Put him off. Oh, and, uh, anyone else have anything else? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, let's give a round of applause. I told you to start saving your money so you could give it to whoever's going to run against her. And Senator Shower's term will be up um, in November of 2022. I don't know whether he's going to run or not, and I'm not asking him to make a commitment. But if uh, you want to continue to have some good legislators like that, this is what you need to do. Start saving, you know. Don't spend all the $1,400 you're going to get, you know, take 140 of it, give it to the church, take the other 140 and <laughs> put it away for a campaign donation to, to somebody because, as he said, he's taking, some, he's taking some arrows down there, and so he needs to be encouraged, so be sure and be praying for him, and uh, we thank you very much, sir, uh, for doing this and look forward to time, I don't know, May, June, July, sometime when you can come in person, everybody can see you, so, okay? Look forward to that, Eddie, thank you very much, and I'll go ahead and sign out tonight and say God bless everybody, I'll take care. Okay, good night. All right, good night. So, as you know, that's our first time we've done Zoom. Um, I think, it, you know, went as well as what you can expect if you, uh, have some ideas of how we could have done it better or something um, because it will get start to get heavier and hotter down in Juno and so there probably will be other people too that will have some legislation so anyway so um, the other thing I had said at the very beginning a few months ago that very seldom would give you homework but I'm gonna give you some homework tonight so everybody go home get on the web and find out what Showers' office phone number is and what his email is and call him, get your friends to call him, send him an email in support of these two pieces of legislation. Uh, so, yes sir. You can also email the committee when, where the bill is being heard. Right. If they yeah. are supposed to put that in the bill package, which means the, the committee members have to look at it. Right. Right. And, yeah, and that's why we have the petitions in the back for Senator Hughes because those tomorrow will go to the committee for the S committee for tomorrow afternoon. Yes, Margaret. Go. Oh, okay. He said you can also reach out to the committee where the bills are being heard. Um, I think um, H uh, or Senate Bill 39 is still in state affairs, which. Senator Shower is the chairman. I don't know of any times when there is hearings coming up on it. And uh, Senate Bill 14 is in Senate Finance. And I don't know if there's anything this week. coming up. Pardon? Sir? This week. This week there'll be a hearing? Okay. There'll be okay. two of them, I think, this week for 14. For 14? Okay, good. Yes, sir. Um, just the info says it's up. Uh, SB uh, 39. Is being heard in state affairs. There's no public testimony uh, mark available, but you can still send your testimony to the Senate uh, committee email address. Right. Yeah. Even if uh, you can't directly testify to the committee. Right. In so, the phone. Yeah. Yeah. And as I said, that's the Senator. The bill, yeah. There's, there's yeah. still an angle. And that committee meeting will be this week according to the legislative uh, schedule. 
Okay, good. Yeah, and that's also sending through showers, but yeah, Jim? Uh, Oh, you want to say something? state anything. I mean, we have people all over the world that have the knowledge, creativity to build cities, right? I mean, how many, how many new cities do you think are being built right now in China? Somebody has that creativity, right? So you take the 85 acres that's there, you carve off 10, 15 acres for the capital, you give the rest of it to a developer, Guess what? You have your capital paid for. They have all the infrastructure. They can do the water, the sewer. They can do the houses. They can do the churches. They can do the strip malls. They can do the grocery stores. It doesn't, it, to put on the ballot how much quote it was going to cost to move the capital was just a red herring so people would vote against it. Does, does not need to cost anything. Right? We, we I have 30 years of experience in real estate. All of you probably bought and sold your own homes. There's another real estate agent sitting right there in your one too. What, I mean, how would you like to have the commission and, this, and the listings on, you know, 1,500, 2,000 houses, right? I mean, it could, it could be all done like that, but it's gotta have, some, somebody has to say, okay, we're doing it, and this is the way we're doing it, and that, we're gonna follow the law that was passed. Yes, Jim. So I've already volunteered to fund myself the Holly Alliance. Holly's looking at you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, we've had a little bit of change of plans uh, since we've been here. As I mentioned earlier, um, March has five um, Mondays. And um, so what I want to do on the fifth Monday is we will meet here at six o'clock but the emphasis will be on the homeschoolers, the young people. So kiddingly, I will tell you, if you are older than 20, you need to bring a young person in order to come, yeah. okay? And you can borrow somebody else's. It doesn't have to be your child or your grandchild or something. We'll have free pizza, and we're just going to have a chat with Edna and allow it for the young people to be able to ask questions, um, and just to encourage them uh, to really come apart. And kiddingly, you know, you can, you can all come, but we'd really like to put the emphasis on bringing children or grandchildren or whatever, and yeah. I think Good. we can easily um, take and bribe them with pizza. So, yeah. so, <laughs> so we'll do that. We'll do that, and it'll be at 6 o'clock rather than 7, and uh, um, Pastor Barry and uh, his wife will do it in there so we can sit and eat, and uh, we won't have to shampoo the carpet in here when we're done. So, oh, so if you all stand, I'll close in prayer. So Lord, first of all, I thank you for your idea of this school of government, Lord. It was not mine, Lord, but it was yours, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for the people that you're drawing and you're bringing in, and the people that are online that are watching and being encouraged. And Lord, please don't allow this to fall on deaf ears. Motivate all of us. Our mission is to educate, motivate, and involve. And involve means more than voting once every two years or once every four years. So Lord, we ask you to show us what exactly you want us to do in each and every one of these situations. My prayer for each one of these people and those also that are online is that they would fulfill the purpose that you have for their lives. All of us, Lord, you have designed us uniquely. You have given us special talents and giftings. And Lord, I ask that each one of the people that hear my voice will develop that purse, that purpose, so that they can stand at that day and say, and you will say, well done, because they have accomplished what you have placed them for in this time. And we are placed in this time, Lord, and you have equipped us. We will not shrink back. We will go forth because, Lord, you have equipped us or you wouldn't have placed this in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, you all, you all know the ritual. Uh, we've got to see everything that is going on here today. Listen, like, share. Uh, Facebook squeals on you if you don't share, so make sure that you do share. Uh, go to my website, www.politidic.com. Click that support button. Your donations go directly into making sure that I can make more events like this one. Puts the gas into the gas tank on that beast that I have to drive. And uh, I really do like being able to give you guys the most and latest up-to-date information that's going on out here in the state, unfiltered. And if without your support, I just can't do it. So go there today. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. You guys have yourself a great evening.